Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast of the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. I want to start today with a confession, and uh, I think that for the first time, I am a little bit intimidated. The reason is that today's guest, Professor RJ Snell, maybe even a friend, uh, but he's nonetheless someone who I admire to the point of feeling that I should just listen to him and memorize whatever he's telling me rather than engaging, as I usually do and as I will try to do, in a lively debate. So that said, good afternoon, RJ, and welcome on our show. Uh, you're overly kind, probably dishonest, but it's good to be with you anyway. So thanks so much for having me. I'm, I promise you, I am already very nervous, uh, but I'll try, I'll try to hide it. I'll do my best to hide it. So let me just add a few words on you. So in addition to being the author of the very good book that we will discuss today, Lost in the Chaos, Immanence, Despair, Hope, R.J. Snell is the Director of Academic Programs at the Witherspoon Institute at Princeton. And there, like we do here at the Austin Institute, but with a lot more experience, he leads and co-leads numerous seminars for college students, for high school students too. And most importantly, as I was able to witness with my own eyes while I was at Princeton, he's one of the base, best uh, male mentors for young men there. And after an episode on the lack of good male models, role models, um, I think that this is great and important news. And for a little more background, prior to his appointment at the Witherspoon Institute, he was for many years professor of philosophy and director of the philosophy program at Eastern University and at Thumpton Honors College, where he founded and directed the Agora Institute for Civic Virtue and the Common Good. Among his most recent books are not only the one we're going to discuss today, but The Perspective of Law, Natural Law in a New Mode, and Assidia and Its Discontents, 2015, which I learned some people were reading in a church here in Austin. A men's group was reading the book on Assidia, and they had no idea that I knew the author, and they were very excited when I told I them know. that. Uh, RJ, what did I leave out? That sounds good. That sounds good. A uh, sailing boat, maybe? I well, like, I wish, I wish I sailed poorly. Yes. Okay. Well, you do. Okay. That's something I recently learned too. So as I was saying, we're discussing today, Lost in the Chaos, uh, a book that you very recently published. Um, and probably I would like to start with a, a bird question related to the title. So who is lost and what is that chaos? Well, thanks, and I uh, appreciate your, your very kind comments. So the book is um, a riff on Walker Percy's book, Lost in the Cosmos, which was published in 1983. So this book came out in December 23, so you know, we're 40 years after Walker Percy. Percy was responding to that famous book, Cosmos, which was turned into a PBS miniseries and so on, which is a big deal in its time which was essentially the claim of what do we do if we're just star stuff, right? If we discover that reductionism is true and there were nothing but matter, how do we make sense of the existential condition? So if you think back to the, to the Greeks, in, in the Greek myths, we have a battle in some, some of the myths between cosmos, which is the principle of order, and chaos, which is either the principle of disorder or the absence of, of order. And the, the, what I speculate is probably true is that the existential kind of questions that Percy is asking in 1983, he's reading a lot of Kierkegaard, he's reading a lot of Gabriel Marcel, that some of those existential questions seem a little quaint to a whole lot of contemporaries in 2023. So here's a story. Some years ago, at least like three years ago, three, four years ago, I was doing a reading group on Albert Camus. I, I love Camus. I think he's, he's just great. I resonate with him enormously. You know, Camus is one of those existentialists, I think, more honest than Sartre. I think Sartre is kind of a fraud. Camus is not a fraud, right? For Camus, the question of why not suicide is a legitimate philosophical question, maybe the only remaining legitimate philosophical question. Anyway, I'm doing this with a bunch of very high-achieving students. And this one young woman just was uninterested. You know, she's so smart, so engaged, so accomplished, and Camus just meant nothing to her. So I asked her why, and this is the analogy she gave to me. It, it's sort of haunted me ever since. She said, you've ever been to the, the dentist and have laughing gas? And I said, well, once. And she said, remember the experience of pain? So you're not unconscious. There is pain happening when you have laughing gas, but it's not happening to you. It's just kind of out there. 
somewhere, you're aware of it, but it doesn't touch you. And she said this, the question that Camus are as, is, is asking is a lot like the experience of being under laughing gas. All my teachers, all my pastors, all my schools, all my, you know, my parents, everything which allowed me to get at this elite school has taught me to be unaffected by these kind of questions because they're a distraction to accomplishment. I, for me, this is like a punch in the gut because it basically means the natural desire for God or the natural desire for order or the natural desire to know or to be an authentic self is shuttled off to the side. And if that's the case, then we're not lost in the cosmos anymore, the way the person you thinks we're lost in the chaos. Uh, and I think that's somewhat culturally descriptive of a whole lot of people at the moment. I mean, you anticipate it. As, this is a story that I think I will remember too, as well, probably some in our audience will. I just saw, you know, it was helping with the recording as one of our interns and it was just saying, I like Camus too a lot. And I would love to hear, you know, if this comment resonated with him in the same way, like if, if it makes sense to comment from that girl. But somehow you anticipated the next question that I had for you. Uh, which was about, you know, who is lost? Because I, I, I thought you mentor and meet a lot of students, but these are the quote unquote, the best students, right? You, you're, you're at Princeton. And statistically speaking, they are sons and daughters of high income, married, very well-educated parents. Uh, may I say married because not only Professor George has said, you know, that anecdotally, that's true, that those are the people that end up being in college, but also there has been a book recently, The Two Parents Privilege, it just shows that this is true. This is actually true, right? So exactly. the people that statistically end up in the best schools were, were raised in, in intact homes. But so, yeah, the question was like, are these the kind of people that are lost? Because someone, you know, when you pick up a book like yours, one can think, you know, oh, are these lost people, just these poor kids, you know, that have no guidance and no education. But I feel like what you just said about the story is like, actually, it's the opposite, that more lost are people who are very, uh, have been taught from the very start that they need to focus on career and just like forget about everything else. Yeah. Think about the, those strange opening sections. If you've read them from Kierkegaard and sickness unto death, there's different ways of being in despair. One way of being in despair is you're aware of it, right? You feel intensely the sense that things don't hang together. The universe doesn't have a point or what have you, your life, your own life doesn't have a point. But there's another way of being in despair, which is to not know you're in despair, right? So if we look at many of the high flyers of our society, I'm thinking here of the, the book and the essay that came before it by, by Bill DeWershowitz, who was then at Yale, Excellent Sheep, which, which is just a fantastic book. Excellent Sheep. He's at Yale and he says, look, my students are uh, disciplined. They almost have like a bespoke life of discipline. They've been working their entire lives to perfect the SAT, to have the perfect GPA, to have all the APs, to master the piano, to be a chess master. I mean, these are impressive human beings. They're, they're better at life than I am in, in almost every respect. But he says, if you peel back the surface, what you see, this, these are his words, are toxic levels of fear. And what they're most afraid of is not succeeding. Because the point of life is to succeed or to have accomplishment. And you're not sure about what, and it might, in fact, not matter what you accomplish so long as you accomplish. So Dershowitz says, it's interesting that his elite students, he was at Yale, they end up, they, they enter Yale and they want to be musicians and join the Peace Corps and poets. They want to go into English and something like 60% of them major in either computer science or economics. And there's nothing wrong with either of those disciplines, but why? It's because they know what success looks like if they take those fields. It means you go to the right law school or you end up at the right Wall Street place or you end up in the right, you know, whatever the cool section in Austin with the tech bros is. I don't yeah. know. And you can tell your parents and your parents can tell their friends at the country club that you've succeeded. Whereas the adventure of life that you might be a poet, who knows if you've succeeded and you probably won't. Mark Schiffman has a great little essay in First Thing Years Ago called Majoring in Fear. And he makes the claim that um, the novel, which really is the novel of the generation, is Hunger Games. Not because everyone reads it, but because it describes the experience of the, of the high accomplished American youth dressed up by the adults for life or death competitions that are fundamentally meaningless, but for the advantage of the adults. Well, that's a kind of lost in the chaos. What's the point of it? No one knows. No one knows what the point is. 
Yeah, they don't. But when they're very smart, as some of the students that we met and as, and as the one that you mentioned at the beginning, they do. Because I have had the pleasure to have, I mean, I can't say mentor, but meet for sure here at the Institute and elsewhere through our circles, young students that have realized this. And they're just like trying to understand why did I want to accomplish? And like, so if they don't have an, end up in despair, it's because they get to read some of the things and some of the philosophers and and to understand, not just to read, but to understand some of the things that you mentioned in your book, whose the subtitles being imminence, despair, hope. So you focus on imminence and how the today's word as is it immanentize, don't immanentize the eschaton, right? I like, guess immanentize the eschaton, uh, the despair that comes from it. And then you end up with an idea of hope. But what I liked very much is that in the description of imminence, you started because the first page of your book, just there is just a sentence that I think explains why even writing the book, which is, quote, we cannot offer hope if we do not adequately understand our moment. So the first part sounds to me like what even the, the committee, you know, the parents that think they're doing a great job should be reading to understand why we have a student like the one you mentioned at the beginning saying, you know, this is, this is laughing gas. But so that said, you talk about this Italian novel by Elena Ferrante, which I'm, I'm fascinated by how fascinated you are with some of the Italian authors. It feels like, you know, it's a, uh, there's Giussani, Ferrante, Del Noce. Like, I feel, you know, I was very proud to read those names. Well, if you want to find a thinker, you turn to Italy, don't you? Well, okay, thank you. You know, I, I hope that one day it will apply, it will apply to me too. I, I doubt it highly, but um, you start by talking about the disenchantment uh, and about Taylor's uh, Taylor's description of the disenchantment of our word. And I, I wouldn't want you to give us, you know, an overview of what Taylor thinks. What I like, and maybe that's the twist that I want to give to this question is like, you argue that in order to have some enchantment, we need some authority. Can you ex expand a little bit on this concept, which I found very interesting? Well, uh, no, the authority is for us kind of a dirty word. You know, we, we think of the boss or we think of illegitimate authority or we think of arbitrariness and tyranny. But authority, which is genuine authority, comes from some kind of office. Now, that office may be one merely of competence, the person who really knows, or it may come from the authority of a long tradition, which has not a dead tradition, but is lively enough to offer a pathway of wisdom to someone who doesn't know. Or it can be an office in the pure sense of the term. Someone is the governor of the state and so has authority. One is the president and ha has a kind of authority. We tend to think of ourselves as radical, radically atomized. I'm me, you're you. We enter into relationships based on some sort of contract, right? Kind of classic social contract theory. There is no state. There is no sovereignty except me. And then I transfer some of my sovereignty to establish the state. Well, then we think the same thing about religion. There can't be any legitimate religion or, a, or tradition or the sages or the elders or the law or custom or what have you uh, until I've, I've agreed to it and transferred my, my in a sense, self-determination to another. You think of the same thing with marriage, right? It's all contract. It's just contract. And of course, marriage without freedom isn't, isn't going to be valid. But it's got to be something more than a contract. When we enter into marriage or we enter into religion or friendship or the state, we're not just unencumbered selves who happen to have now entered into a relationship where we can sever that relationship in basically the same manner that we entered into it. We have a kind of obedience or docility to whatever it is that we're entering into. It's something which precedes us, and it's something which is larger than us. It doesn't swamp our self-determination. It's the condition of our self-determination. Um, forgetting, forgetting his name, Victor Lee Austin, I think, wrote a book a couple of years ago on authority, and he used a great example of the conductor of a symphony. You know, there are those who think conducting is easy. You're just kind of waving your arms around or keeping beat or something. But it turns out the great conductors really get more out of their orchestra than a bad conductor would. And it's the authority of the conductor which allows not only the flourishing of each of the instrumentalists on their own, right? Now we have a really great cellist playing. Now we have a really great flautist playing. 
but you can't get the symphonic aspect without the conductor. You would just have the individual line of the violist and the individual line of the cellist and the individual line of the, of the flautist, but you wouldn't get the symphony. You wouldn't get the piece. And so you need authority, particularly not, not only for our own individual flourishing, but particularly if you're hoping to have the common good or something which is more than my scrabbling attempt to make meaning of my life. I can't have meaning of my life as a person without sociality. You know, right? that, the, the idea of the person is different than the individual. The individual is a metaphysical unit, right? One cat, two cat, three cat, four. The word, the category person is irreducibly social. One is a person for another, alongside another. One is oriented towards the other as a person. And you always need something which is preceding us to show the way so that there's a pathway of wisdom so that we can do, do that well. And so this authority that that allows us to have an enchanted word or re-enchanted word is an authority that, again, it's not something we, we give authority to, but precedes us. It's already we, there. It's, it's generative. Gen genuine authority, it seems to me, is more than just power. Well, that not seems to me. It just is more than power, right? Power might lead to authority. Authority may have power, but they're not the same thing. Authority is not simply power over us. Authority has the capacity to be generative and directed where that generativity and directedness doesn't preclude my own spontaneity or my own actualization or my own governance. It's the condition of my governance. And this is, this is how I think of the natural law. I love this idea from, I, I learned from Martin Ronheimer that we should think of the natural law as participated theonomy. So it's a participation in God's law of the world. But God determines if there's a God of providence, God determines not only what will happen, but how it will happen. And the way that God has determined human things is through our own self-governance. So the law of God is the condition of possibility of my self-governance. But God hands me over to myself to govern myself. Or better, he hands us over to ourselves to govern ourselves as individuals, as families, as nations, and so on. But there's nothing about the authority of God which interferes with my governance. It's the very means by which I can govern myself, as opposed to being, you know, a meat robot scrabbling for self-interest, uh, you know, and the endless agonism of the market and politics and, and uh, the sexual marketplace or something, right? Life's more than, than that kind of marketplace. Why? Make... Because we share something in common. Which makes me think that authority for you is, it could be substituted in many ways with reality, that there is a, this reality that precedes us. I mean, it includes religion, but. Um, and so the other thing that you made me I think, think is the that universe is friendly, right? So yeah. that's part of the, the purpose of, of just chapter seven and eight. So seven is a, a reading, it's, it's probably the most boring section of the book, but I think. There was no, 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 there is no boring. I didn't say it was boring. Though. I said it was the most boring okay, section. Okay, okay. Which is a reading of Aquinas' Dante at Essentia on being in essence. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the point okay. is to show that reality, right. yeah. reality itself is dynamic and generative. It's not a cold, stark universe, right? We don't live in a vacuum of forces. We live in a world which is oriented towards the outpouring of new, new life, new form, more intelligibility. And then chapter eight on Luigi Giussani, that mm -hmm. if the universe is actually polymorphic, reason has to be polyvalent, right? Yes. We need, we need many paths to know a many past reality. But reality is, in fact, generous and friendly. Uh, so, yeah, reality is before us as a kind of authority. But, you know, so many people believe, it seems to me at the moment, that anything which is a given is hostile or heteronymous to their own freedom. And, and I think that's entirely backwards, that the given of, givenness of reality is the condition of being free. And so we find reality as pushing us towards our actualization and in a sense kind of cheering for us. So this is kind of corny, but um, when, when I read something like Genesis 1 and 2, I read Genesis 1 and 2 as you know, the whole universe is in a sense waiting for the human person to emerge. There's a kind of a eager expectation where even dirt is waiting for the breath of life, you know, in, in the quaint image of God kind of kissing the dirt to, to make Adam. 
but the dirt is waiting for it. There's a disposition to receive more reality. And so the givenness of just dirt is the condition of the person. And the givenness of reality is the condition of our own generativity, freedom, happiness, thriving, fullness, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll keep nodding as, as long for as long as you speak. And you already mentioned a list of names and you know, that anyone listening should just start reading. Another uh, Italian, yeah. Giussani? Well, yeah, the Giussani, I mean, when, yeah. when you just, you mentioned him and I love that this part where you, you're, the reason is larger than science. And this is where I feel that I love, I lose most of the conversations that I have with people that say or argue that they disagree on some of the things they were doing. They, they, they are doing this, you know, there is this attempt to just sort of reduce reason to science and there's just such a limited and you you do make an example you know it seems like how do you describe love you know with a scientific equation it's like do you are you scientifically sure of the love of your wife or you or like vice versa right and that's i'm gonna stick her into an mri machine and say do you love me and oh the wrong part of the brain lit up it's not really love or i'm gonna check pupil dilation what who could care that's not what we're looking for none of which is to diminish science science is perfectly competent in the things it's competent in, but it's not competent in the domains of reality, which are nonetheless real, which have to be known in other ways. And I, I have a dozen more questions. I promise that I will not give a spoiler of the whole book and I will let people, you know, want to read it. So I'll try to jump from one topic to another that you address. Again, there is an order. You know, even if I don't follow an order, there is a clear order in your book. You describe imminence, you describe the following despair, and then you describe why we have reasons to hope. In talking about this imminence and getting to the despair, you talk about, well, I, I love definitely the part about the religious spiritual tourism of, you know, the, the new generations, and you call it tourism, it's no, it's no more a religious experience. But the part that I would like to focus is what you call the malaise um, of mastery. Yeah. Um, and somehow I read in that chapter a criticism of the sentence that, you know, was from, uh, President Obama made famous, yes, we can. Like, it, it feels like that there, I, now, do you want to explain why reading your, that, that chapter made me think that, um, and, and, you know, also what, if mastery generates this malaise, what could we do to know that we are being good men, good women? Well, I'll let you explain your own political positions on President Obama. I, I won't, I won't have any of my own, um, in, in the book, Homo Deus, Yuval Noah Harari has this lovely image, and, and the book is actually more sophisticated than his introduction. He, he's a little more skeptical than it sounds in the introduction, but he, he gives this image. At the dawn of the 21st century, man wakes up, kind of stretches and says, what's on the agenda? And what's on the agenda is to get rid of all the ancient enemies of, of humanity, plague, famine, and war. And when the book was written, it seemed like all those things could possibly go away. Right? It was pre-COVID. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. It was the end of history. Nothing was happening in Ukraine or Israel, right? And, and of course, famine we can deal with. Well, how? Well, the way all of that goes away is we realize that we really are just wet robots with hardware and software in a universe of force and energy. There's no more acts of God. So if a tornado happened, it's because of the climate. And if we're impacting the climate, well, we're to blame. Or if there's poverty in the city, well, there should be a hack for that. Or if someone is unhappy, well, there's medication and therapy for that. And as a result, he says, even the things that we thought of as inevitable parts of reality, like death, death is optional. Death is not the result of the fall. Death is not a result of the curse of God. It's not Pandora's box was opened. It's your heart stops. And if we can give you a new valve for the heart, we can give you a new valve for the heart. But if you don't have the new valve, someone is to blame. Bill McClay takes up that idea. He's not in conversation with Harari, but it's a similar sort of idea. There's no more acts of God. There's no more providence. There's no more fates. There's just you and me and our choice. We have mastery. So we think, well, if everything is up to human mastery and we have incredible scientific and technological and medical capacities, then there shouldn't be floods in New Orleans. There shouldn't be the homeless in Austin. There shouldn't be anxious middle schoolers. And there shouldn't be death. 
<laughs> well, there are the homeless in Austin, or at least that's what I read. Yeah. There was a big flood in New Orleans. There are unhappy middle schoolers. Well, someone is to blame. So mastery creates a sense of malaise. And McClay says that what was predicted by somebody like Francis Bacon in the New Organon is that we would bend, if Bacon uses this very gross image that, that nature is a woman, and so you can make her do what you want, with this sort of masculine energy of science. Nature is a woman. Everything is up to the male rationality to do as we wish to nature. But nature is incredibly pliable. Machiavelli is something similar. Lady Fortuna, control, la yeah. control Lady Fortune, make her do as you wish. So if fortune in nature isn't going in your favor, well, you could have controlled it and you didn't. So in the old ethics, we tend to think that um, ought implies can. If you ought to be able to do something, then, then you, you must be able to do it, right? So I use the example. If I, if I can be commanded, or I ought to keep a, a, a fast, let's say, on Ash Wednesday, but I, I can be commanded to keep the fast on Ash Wednesday because I can actually not eat for a day. Yeah, it's the, the Latin saying is that ad impossibilia nemo tenetur, right? Yeah, exactly. Never, yeah. But it, it's meaningless to command me to say that I ought not feel an appetite on a fast day because I can't control appetite, right? That's just a physiological response. And so I'm going to have appetite. But the new kind of moral command is that is not that ought implies can, but can implies ought. So we can solve these problems. Therefore, we're obligated to solve these problems, and there's no one else to blame. We can't blame God. We can't blame the past because it's just us. So can implies ought. We can solve everything under technology. And nonetheless, McClay says, all we find is that we're racked with anxiety. We thought we were going to turn into the Francis Bacon, you know, sort of Ubermensch controlling nature or the Machiavellian Ubermensch or the Nietzschean Ubermensch. And instead, we're racked with anxiety because there are bad things in the world. Someone's to blame and somebody must get fixing them now. Right. But it's always someone should get fixing them now. That's a malaise of mastery. Yeah, that is. And I mean, said, you know, also in other in other terms, if anyone didn't understand, which is impossible not to understand you, but like, you know, since we since we have. Since we can, in theory, create policies that will make the homeless disappear, we need to do that. At the same time, we need to have stay-at-home mom being able to feel accomplished with their work. At the same time, we need to have I know, kids that have free access to whatever school they want to go to. And we, and we realize this is never possible. That's why the question that I had for you afterwards was like, okay, so if we can't accomplish everything, where do we... Where do we find guidance for like, when is it enough, right? When, when is it that you did enough with your day or with your life? You know, one of the, the things that I'm trying to articulate in the final chapters, it, you know, I sort of get it. Uh, it, it. I get that hope can feel kind of quaint as, a, as an idea. You know, the world's burning, have hope. Well, okay, that seems nice and self-congratulatory and probably leads to a kind of quietism and self-congratulation. But here's a story that I like. I, I need to look this up because I'm forgetting the details now. Some years ago, I think this is in the 1800s, there was one of the Oxford colleges which realized that the, the huge oaken beams in the chapel were starting to rot out. And they scoured all over the United Kingdom and they couldn't find any oaks that were large enough to replace these beams. And they scoured all over the place and there weren't trees large enough. And they finally called in the, the gardener of the college, and he, and he said something like the following, oh, the college planted those trees in 1620, you know, hundreds of years before those trees were planted, so they would be ready by 1890. Well, that's building in hope. So I don't know if this is an urban legend or not, but I, I'm told uh, that this is true. There was a, a Protestant seminary. It matters that it's Protestant here because of the particular eschatology of this particular denomination, who built a seminary in the 1950s, but they thought that God was going to return by 1990. So they only built the buildings to last for about 30 or 40 years. But then, of course, God apparently did not return by year 2000. And so now they're stuck with buildings which are basically driving them into bankruptcy because they are entirely collapsing and falling apart. All right, look at the two differences of those two scenarios. The one, we're going to be here hundreds of years from now. 
So let's think of our own lives individually, familially, culturally. Let's think of the national life as a going concern where we're building for hundreds of years from now, millennia from now, as opposed to, well, it's all going to kind of collapse in 10 years or we'll let someone else worry about this. So it turns out, I think, that the kind of religious virtue of hope, which I think is a it, it, I'm arguing that there is, is sort of a natural analogs to hope, but that hope proper is a, is a, is a theological virtue given by, by God. But it turns out that religious hope is not pie in the sky or quietism, but is in fact a long, an act of intelligence and human perfection by which we don't look for merely short-term bandages and solutions, but we have enough intelligence and forethought to build for centuries and millennia from now. And that's always more intelligent than building for two years from now. So Bernard Lonergan is someone that I've learned a lot from the, the Canadian Jesuit, 1904-84. He has this idea that the dialectics of history are progress, decline, and redemption. So if you think about a thought experiment, if human beings genuinely were perfectly intelligent, we have good ideas, they get turned into good policies, which would get turned into to good education, which would get turned into smart people who would collaborate and cooperate, which would get turned into good policies. We just have this dialectic of progress. But it, of course, it doesn't work that way because we love darkness rather than light and we're stupid right. and we don't collaborate and we're biased and we love ours and hate theirs and so on. So we have decline. He says that some decline is just a short pattern. You made a mistake. You did the wrong thing and it, there's a disruption, but it's not that big of a deal because you see it in time, you can fix it, you make plans and so on. The longer pattern of decline is where you introduce something so unintelligent that you're beginning to reject intelligence itself. Now you make a policy. That policy doesn't turn out. You panic. You make an even worse policy. You panic. You turn your education system into something even worse to solve the short-term problem, which is now blind to the long-term needs of intelligence. And you have what he calls the longer pattern of decline, where a civilization digs its grave, he says, with relentless consistency. A civilization in decline digs its grave with relentless consistency. Well, the solution, he says, in part, is to have enough commitment to intelligence to allow things like charity and hope to disrupt your short-term concerns where you're panicking yeah. and to think what would intelligence demand in the long term and how would we accomplish that? And so it turns out in an odd way that it's politically and socially and economically practical to be thinking about yeah. something 500 years from now, assuming that we're going to be here yeah. and that our great-grandchildren, and the way I've thought about it lately is not my great-grandchildren, I guess it'd be longer than that, but my great grandchildren's friends are involved, right? I need to be planning for the well being and happiness of my great grandchildren's friends. Well, that's the, I think, the measure of a life lived well. If at the end of your life, you've played your small part into the flourishing of your great grandchildren's friends. friends. Wow. And we, I want to, I want to promote the podcast with this, with this sentence, like, and, 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 you know, it, it's, it, was then also to another problem we've addressed in another ways this inability of today of like having delayed gratification right and here we're not just talking about delayed gratification in like 5 10 15 20 years but like a delayed gratification that involves a true belief you know not like humanitarianism that helps the the homeless guy next to me right now but is a greater belief in love in humanity and in its capacity to grow, so what you call this intelligence that animates us. Um, you mentioned among, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of fascinating things, the false, uh, you call them, what is it, the false, the sirens or the idyls? The idyls, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I like idyls because it's, it's uh, you know, an assonance with idols, but doesn't sound so quite so aggressive. But idyls, yeah, I-D-Y-L-L-S, which in art is a sort of overly pastoral, bucolic scene where everything is lovely, but it's not. Right. And so that there is this tendency we could, we could, I mean, the way I read it is like anyone who is understanding this problem of imminence and disenchantment and despair might be attracted and, and fall for the illusion of some solutions that you say are actually not long-term solution. One of them, perhaps interesting to the, to the people that 
usually like our programs or come to our reading groups is the one where everything is politics, right? And and there is a, which somehow what we just said might create that illusion, right? That, but why would that be wrong? Why is that not an actual solution? Yeah, so the, the three idols, I, idols uh, that I talk about in the book are um, humanitarianism as, as defined by Pierre Menent. So we don't mean you know, sending aid to Haiti or something when there's troubles there. We mean the religion of humanity, where that's the only game in town is a universal extension to all humans, but an absence of any intention, meaning we don't define anything. So justice always becomes a negation. We're just solving injustice, but we don't actually know what we're trying to bring about. Uh, another idol is rationalism in politics, where, rash, where politics is total, meaning all-encompassing. It covers everything, and it's final. It's, it's the ultimate authority. And then the third is you know, spiritual tourism, woo-woo, fake attempts to re-enchant the world, or kind of LARPing, live-action role-playing, the people who want to have the magic of the sacramental world and not believe in the sacraments, right? They, I sort of, they read too much Tolkien and think this is the way the world really is or something like that, right? It's goblins and fairy tales. Woo-woo. Rationalism, you know, here I'm borrowing a lot from, from Michael Oakeshott and one of my favorite essays, Rationalism in Politics. Oakeshott asked the following question. When we think of rationalism, we tend to think of a kind of early modern philosophical view. I think somebody like Leibniz or Spinoza or Descartes. We're going to get to apodictic, a priori premises. Reason is going to look a lot like Euclid's elements. We've got our postulates and our axioms, and now we just deduce to universal and necessary conclusions. Reason is just geometric. Right? So Hume, geometry is the real reason. Uh, Spinoza, geometry is the real reason. Now, if you think that politics seems to be almost immune from rationalism, we know that politics is about the art of the possible, compromise, um, you have to make alliances with people you don't particularly care for. It's about action, which is always a bit uncertain. It's about contingency and so on. And Oakeshott admits that rationalism in politics doesn't work the way that Leibniz's monadology works, where you have a postulate and that would just deduce to conclusions. Instead, he's, instead, he says it's more like a mood or a temper. So the rationalist hates temporality. The rationalist hates contingency. The rationalist hates the best that you can do at the moment. Yeah. The rationalist hates. Why am I thinking about the integralists now? Like, is that uh, just well, a, I mean, they're not, named, they're, not, they're not named in the book, but that's the point of the yeah. chapter is, in fact, it's funny. I have friends who say, oh, that chapter is really directed against the left and the progressive plan, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, no, that chapter is directed entirely at the right. Yeah. And all the ideas that if we just had a new, you know, Aristotelian theocracy, or yeah. theocracy or a Christian nation or the papal states, things would be great. You know, yeah, I don't think the papal states were that well managed. I mean, Rome can't manage its money now. I don't think they can man manage the United States economy either. The, the rationalist doesn't want a patch job. They want everything to be perfect from the standpoint of eternity. And so politics needs to be uniform. It needs to be total and it needs to be now. And I think that is a, a grave idol, I-D-Y-L-L. -L. It's a picture of perfection that cannot be accomplished. And it's a fake version of hope. It's attempting to replace the actual virtue of hope and the kind of politics which you would do in light of hope with you know, a 10-year plan to world perfection where you have forgotten such things as the human person, human dignity, human agency, the need for freedom and religion. And our, follow, and our fallible nature, right? The fact our that it nature. doesn't matter how perfect the system is. You're we, still you and I'm still me. Yeah. They forget how grace works. If, there, if we are talking about theology and religion, they mm -hmm. forget that grace doesn't occupy a life hack. Grace, grace is not a life hack. There's no app for grace where if you do it every day for five days, suddenly you know, you're, you're set. It just doesn't work that way. Politics has its own logic. And it's not as if the logic of politics is amoral or immoral or unintelligent. It just has its own intelligence, which is the intelligence of action. And action is about the concrete agent, or agent could be a nation, at a particular time, in a particular place, with particular proposals, 
doing what can be done through the action, which doesn't work like in Aristotelian syllogism. It's not universally valid. It's not necessary. The conclusion is our best estimate. And if we're not going to run roughshod over human freedom, we know that there's a joker in the deck. And the joker is all these free people who are going to do whatever free people do. And it's wrong always and everywhere for me to coerce their conscience or to disallow their freedom. And Judas is there, right? For the, yeah, for the money you would sell your teacher. Like, yeah. I mean, yep. it's, 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 uh, and Aristotle, you mentioned Aristotle's quote. So it's not something that we discover now that is the nature of acting to obtain less truth than speaking. So yep. it's, you know, you can have the perfect system and, and words, but then it just doesn't work that way. Socrates is brilliant in the Republic. Well, Socrates, how will we bring about the city in speech? And he says, don't ask me how I would do that. We're going to get as close as we can. Yeah. And, um, the, and you also mentioned, you know, like, why is it polit politics is not for young people, which doesn't mean don't get involved in politics, but there is a level of experience of what human beings are capable of that is probably also necessary, which is, I, I usually say, that's why we have even have the word Senate, right? Like there is a, there is a, a chamber that needs to be the one of maturity in theory. Um, in, in, in theory. Yeah. The, the one thing I, um, okay, your, your book is a message of hope and I don't want, I'm going to encourage everyone to read it. Probably we're going to read it here with the, the young professionals, probably even the old, what I call now the, the good life plus, the, the older professionals that want to read with us and, and learn uh, together. Because your book is, is really just, it's very rich. And all the, the people you mentioned now, as we were speaking, and there's a lot more in the book that can be read. But as a message of hope, I'm here, you know, asking you, okay, you write this book because clearly you do believe in this intelligence that lasts longer than our limited lives. You've had you have five five children, so of course you are thinking about your grandchildren's friends because there will be. Uh, but what is the kind of hope that you you have? You know, with, with the work you do, right? You you're running the Witherspoon Institute, and you see students coming in. Is it a hope that is real? Like, do do we see signs of people wanting to ask? questions that have not been asked for a while that you mentioned by the way that story i didn't know about that he just strength by c.s lewis the that story where words have lost all their meaning and people are asking crazy questions to each other that make no sense i want to read it very soon uh but yeah can you see a tendency in another way that there is a desire in these young people to recover meaning uh you would like to say so but you can't yeah. It's it's funny, you know, the, the book really is about hope, but, you know, you quoted the line, if you want to have hope, you need to know where you are. And a lot of my friends are telling me, boy, your chapters on despair really seem to resonate, you know, as if it's coming right from you. And the chapters on hope, it seems like you're trying to get yourself there, you know, you're trying to believe it. And I don't I don't actually think that's true. I, I think that we can look the contemporary conditions full in the face, admit that there's a lot going wrong in our society. I mean, you just have to read the stats, right? The demographic rate is 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 collapsed, right? Europe is over. Italy is a it was a lovely place, right? But demographically, it's it's just kind of done. It's not going to recover. Marriage rates in the United States, the deficit, loss of religion, you you name it, right? You you can find a lot that's going wrong. It, you know, I feel like every social gathering I go to, there's a cluster. Uh, of people complaining about, with great rage and indignation, religious leaders, political leaders, universities, you name it. Everyone's just kind of angry all the time. Well, Aristotle tells us in the ethics that anger is less shameful than giving in to, more, to other to, to sort of desires of the flesh because, because anger hears reason. It just misinterprets it. So in the face of injustice, you should feel angry. If, some, if, if there's an injustice, anger is an appropriate and entirely rational response, but not to hang out in anger. The point is that anger becomes a motive force for correcting the injustice or seeking atonement or asking for forgiveness or whatever. When it's not supposed to hunker down in anger, that does no good to anyone. So I think not only is hope a genuine virtue, where I take virtue to mean in the old Aristotelian sense, a perfection of the human being. 
So hope is not a, a character trait of like some people are cheerful, other people are morose. It's not optimism. You know, it's not that blind sense of I've joined the optimist club. Everything in America is the best country ever. Everything's just going to get better and better in every way, better and better every day because America. Well, no, that's optimism. That is a subjective disposition as opposed to a virtue, which is a disposition of the subject, a disposition of the human being. Right. It's not subjective in sense of a decision, right? It's, yeah, it is a way that one is. It's a second nature. But as a virtue, it's a perfection. It makes us more alive, more human, more capable of acting, more capable of thinking. You never virtues never turn off or dim down humanity. They always turn it up so that we can be more capable of being fully alive and fully in act. So do I see signs of that? Sure. So, you know, Witherspoon and Austin, places like this. I don't think we're naive or just sort of like clapping wildly for the state of affairs in the world. Like we got everything just where we want. Like things can, things are pretty bad in many ways. And yet, what do we see? We see young men and women. This is, you know, who we do a lot of work with you at Austin, me at Witherspoon. We see a lot of young men and women who are just as young men and women have ever been, if they are allowed to be, which is they want to ask, what sort of life shall I lead? Whom shall I love? Shall I love? And what can I hope? What's the point of this? And some of them will articulate a kind of frustration that their, their rightful patrimony, their intellectual heritage has, has been taken away from them. How is it that no one has ever... I have an undergraduate degree. How is it that I've never read Aristotle or Plato or Shakespeare or Machiavelli or Hume? What happened here? Or how is it that I've gone to church my whole life and never been catechized or introduced to the church fathers? or been, been given Aquinas or Augustine or Calvin or fill in the blank of whatever the denomination. How did this happen that Christianity looks like it was invented in 1973 or 1986 with just all the cultural baggage of, of, of those era? If we've been at this for a while, actually. We've thought about all of these things. We've suffered a, a lot in the history of religion, Judaism, Christianity, and that's just in the West and the Middle East and the East, right? We extend. People have suffered and thought for a long time. Nothing's changed about the human condition. We want to know. Leon Cass, some years ago, who was one of my intellectual heroes, gave a talk at Princeton, and he, he basically, I don't know if you get this reference, um, I don't know if you, if, you, if you get Field of Dreams and baseball references. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. If, if, you build, yeah. if you build it, they'll come. And Cass says, look, young people, if you offered them things, they would do it. But all we're offering them is yet another class in resume building. So they do what they're supposed to. So I see young, and me young men and women full of hunger for things. Yeah. Uh, and I see them being in some ways more sophisticated than their elders because they have lived through some of the cultural. Their eyes are wide open about the cultural moment. They know that their friends are racked with anxiety because they've been on social media since they were 12. Right? They know that. Yeah. They know Better that. than their parents. Yeah, yeah. better than their parents. Their, their boomer grandparents are still sort of opening up videos of, of, to show them how amusing the internet is. Well, this 18-year-old knows that the internet is not so amusing. Right, that there's really dark corners of the internet, and you know, 4chan and 8chan and Red Pill, and pretty soon you can get yourself into some bad places politically and socially. I think that if we offered them real questions, they'll they'll ask them. Yeah, and they're doing I, it all the time. They're doing it all the time. Yeah, and I agree with you, and that's the reason why. After the Witherspoon started its its work, there have been like what is it, twenty five other institutes that are sort of copied and pasted and in their own way did it the other programs similar to what you do there uh providing this kind of knowledge that very often doesn't provide credit uh, sometimes it does but that's not the reason why students come and that's not the reason why they read books like yours um i was wondering if you have you know other suggestions of like i would say two or three books that young men and women could should read um yeah. I'm not a dyed in the wool um, fan of John Sr., but I have learned some things from John Sr. 
John Sr. started, I'm, I'm probably going to get the details wrong. I can never remember, remember who it was, Kansas State or the University of Kansas. You gave me that. I read that book out because you suggested it. I can't remember which one. And you know, his tone is darker than, than, than I would have it sometimes. But he makes the, the following point, which I think is a good one. We've been so conditioned and mediated of our access to reality that we have a hard time actually getting into reality. So he says that for a lot of people, the idea of handing them the great books can be a bit of a stretch. I mean, he says you hand them first the good books or even the pretty good books. So I think that there's a place for people to not read what they're supposed to. This is a, this is a line from that Lewis uses in Screw Tape as well. Don't read what you're supposed to because it's on the New York Times bestseller list, or you can show off at the faculty party afterwards. Read something you think is genuinely delightful, beautiful, and full of excitement. Right? I, so, for instance, I hand a lot of students Wind in the Willows because it's just beautiful and it's about friendship and loyalty and it's funny and about adventure. Or it, one is so mediated that we've forgotten the sense of the beautiful. Um, go look at the stars. Or our erotics are so messed up. Go and have an actual dance. Like go to a, a oh, you find a lot of support in me. Or or a, or a Jane Austen style line dance, or you know something corny that you'll laugh about, like square dancing, where it turns out that you can dance with your grandpa and your godmother and your child and your niece and your friend because. It's actually a training of erotics in a non-erotic sense, right? It's, it's not sort of the club scene, you know, the kind of awfulness of that. Yeah. You know, Lewis, uh, uh, Elliot's so good at this. Um, it's the four quartets, yeah, or the wasteland. It's four quartets, right? Heavy feet, low feet, dancing in country mirth. What are they doing? Well, they're celebrating marriage, a dignified and commodious sacrament. And they're, now I'm misquoting it, but, and they're nourished by those long under the corn, right? Because they're dancing the dances that their forefathers and mothers dance. You know, so in addition to books, I think there's a lot of good ones, you know, Plato, Aristotle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aquinas, Luther, whatever. In addition to all the good, the great books, read a bunch of really good ones like Wind in the Willows or Narnia or Tolkien, but then get out of the book and make your own poetry or turn off the record player and grab a guitar right? Or turn off TikTok and have a dance yourself, like push back the couches and, and live reality, right? And can I, okay. Be a real that, Sabbath feast and invite your friends over and, and, and dance and sing and eat. So, I mean, reality is good. We were talking about this earlier. Get into it. Get into reality as a way, as opposed to away from it, away from it, away from it. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, you didn't. I was interrupting you because that's my specialty. But the reason that I was interrupting you is if you do not dare doing it alone, we have had our stargazing night. We have our dancing nights. Like that's part of our vision here is precisely that. Like in order to have you inquire about the truth, the good and the beautiful, let me give you, you know, a, a foretaste of them and like to so that you realize that they're actually out there and then you'll find your way to get there. Um, since it's a personal journey all, at all times. RJ, I promised you it would have been an hour and we've been like perfect, like Swiss, not definitely not Italian. Yeah. Like, like Swiss. <laughs> You're like Swiss, she says, the Italian, when, when she's on time, says, look, I'm like a Swiss today. That's exactly what we do. Uh, well, they're the one that made that. They, they, they make watches. Um, RJ, thank you very much. Uh, as usual, you're a delight to talk to. Uh, I've heard that one of your son might be coming to going to Baylor soon, which means you, we might have you in Texas, which means you'll get an invitation from us. And I hope you will talk to our students. But for now, thank you very much for, for your work, for your book, and for spending some time with us. Uh, delighted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the episode of our show, What We Can't Not Talk About. If you did like the episode, remember to share it among your friends. Do not forget to subscribe. And if you can, please donate to the Austin Institute. Your donations make it possible for us to continue to do this. But above all, they support our local programming and the important, if not crucial, research of our fellows. Thank you.